Good morning. Um, I also like to joke, I'll preface that ahead of time, Kevin normally talks and then he explains his joke. Um, I may have to do that too, uh, but I'm going to say that up front, so if I sound awkward or strange, you can laugh, it's okay. Um, my wife was just telling me uh, that I should drink something. Um, it's been a long week for us. Uh, it was mentioned Annika and I are missionaries and we're, Lord willing, going to be deploying back to Spain in the fall. Uh, we're in transition with those of you that have heard about the missions organizations. And why do I have so much water? You're going to find out. It's a good question. That's a great question. Okay. Do you know, that's one of the things I like about this church, is that when we've been sitting out here and questions get thrown up to Kevin, uh, it's a little bit more pressure for me because I don't know all you guys, but I like questions. And I like interactions, so it's okay to do that too. Uh, there's a reason why I actually put this, but I haven't gotten to that yet. But <laughs> so, so, you know, as Kevin comes up here and he takes off his shoes, um, I'm not going to do that today because I want people to be alive while they're listening. Um, <laughs> uh, but I will preach from down here on the floor and um, I thank you for those that have been praying for me where we've been tending a small group this church has been a great blessing to us as we travel on weekends and visit churches and have uh, commitments that we have to meet uh, Annika and I have been consistent on Wednesday nights so I see some of the small group people here and some that have come back that have been away for a little bit um, we're th so blessed by great church uh, by our small group and the passage I'm going to talk about today to I'm not going to tell you yet and I notice it's not published in the bulletin today that's good that plays in well um, is a passage um, that really ties in well I think at least it popped in my mind hopefully it will with you as well um, with what you guys have been studying sort of since the beginning of the year with Joseph's life you've spent quite a bit of time on that it's really good and uh, Annika and I had the privilege of helping out with Grace Kids and then uh, I got to help with the discipleship class that was over there I think it was how to study the Bible you guys can correct me if I'm wrong um, and so it even tied in with that of thinking about contextualizing things in, in the one village and then bringing it into our context. And then at small group this week, we talked about Micah, which is one of the minor prophets. It's kind of complicated, but we're going to see today that everything in the passage that we're looking at at least in my mind, and hopefully you'll see it too, ties into God's word and it's all it's related to Christ. And um, so those of you that do take notes, I see somebody getting ready, that's good. Um, I don't have all the slides up that I was hoping to today, but that's okay. I'm going to give you a word description and, and we'll do that. Um, and I apologize, I had this nice tablet today to bring and I plugged it in and then I forgot it. So not only do I have my, my small Bible, which has mini print in it, uh, <laughs> but I also have my phone. So, I said I was going to drink some water, so let me drink some water here. And I'm going to ask, is anybody else thirsty? That's why I had this. I need some interaction. Come, somebody didn't bring their water. Do you want some? So I'll, I'll give you one. Who else would like one? I'm not going to throw it back there, but maybe somebody can take it back there. So here's one here. Uh, you can pass it down. This is probably really weird walking through the sanctuary. Came to preach and now he's walking around. So I came today to bring water. Um, Maybe you can guess what passage I'm going to talk about. But before we get there, how about we pray? So, Father God, uh, thank you for this day that we can gather together as your people and open your word. Um, this week has been tiring for many of us, uh, but Lord, I pray that you would give me clarity of mind as we, as we sing, that you would use my intellect and my lips uh, to speak your truth, Lord, and uh, would your spirit clearly speak through me today. Pray that I would become less, that you would become greater, and that what is remembered uh, would be of you and not of me, Lord. So thank you. We give you this time and pray that you lead us in it and instruct us by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, some of you might have already guessed water. Okay, he's going to talk about water. It's a New Testament. You guys have been in the Old Testament for a while. Um, we're going to go to living water. Does anybody that thinks of a story that comes to mind? No. Good guess. New Testament, though. It's in the book of John. 
So if you have your Bibles today, get them out, and we're going to be in John 4. I figured that since I'm a missionary, and I love evangelism and discipleship, those are kind of my skill set areas, that it would be appropriate for a missionary to talk about something evangelistic, right? And uh, because that's what we're all about. We should be as the body of Christ. And so as I was praying and getting ready to come here, this is the passage that kept popping in my mind. Um, it might seem like something that's simple. It's like, okay, I heard that story lots of times in Sunday school. I'm sure many of you could tell me uh, what the story is about with the Samaritan woman at the well. Um, and that's great. Um, with... Everything that we've been studying, the cool thing is, and I'm going to read it here, but we're going to see how it ties in to Joseph, because does anybody know where the well is? Samaria. Samaria. But what is Samaria? Like, if you remember the 12 tribes, they came in and they took the land after they came out of Egypt. And remember, at the end of uh, Genesis, he said, you know, Jacob said, bring my bones back, bury them. Does anybody know where that was? It was by Shechem. It's where he had purchased the land for a, a hundred silver coins. And it is by Jacob's well that he dug. So this, we're having a connection from the Old Testament that's coming. And if you remember, at the end of, of Genesis, when we were doing that, uh, when we were studying it, um, his brothers had intentions, but God had a greater plan. And... Um, I think in verse 20 here of Exodus 50, it says, You intended harm to me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Um, this is pointing not just to the saving of God's chosen people that he would use as a missionary nation to share the good news of Jesus Christ, who is our Savior, uh, the only one who can cleanse us of our sins and restore our relationship with the Father. But it ties all the way together, pointing to the Savior that will come, that is Christ. My apologies, i got to look down at my notes sometimes. <laughs> so if you remember... Oops, excuse me. Joseph died, and years later, you have Moses bring the people. He dies, not entering into the promised land. Joshua goes in, and one of the first places they came in was by Shechem. Shechem is where um, Abraham had, was met with by God, and he built an altar there. So as we talk about the Jewish people and the Samaritans today, and as we consider some of the cultural inter complications and uh, with the context in which that village was, so that we can understand it for us today, we have to understand that um, this was a place that had multiple times that it was very important that people go back. So nothing was arbitrary. Everything in Scripture is pointing to Christ, and we're going to see that hopefully today. And if you were studying Micah this week, I'm going to see if I can flip it real quick. Um, it's a complicated passage, so I'm maybe in danger a little bit of trying to tie this in. But, um, but the whole thing you see... What happens in the people of Israel? They rebel against God, they repent, and they're restored over and over again. And here you, you see them in rebellion again, and Micah says there's judgment coming, but at the end of Micah, uh, a well, even in chapter 2, there's a deliverance that's promised. It says, One who breaks open the way will go before them. They will break through the gate and go out. Their king will pass through before them, the Lord at their head. And at the end of that, um, you also see where it says, Who is God like you, who pardons sins and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight in, to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl our iniquities into the depths of the sea. You will be true to Jacob and show mercy to Abraham as you have pledged an oath 
to our fathers in days long ago. So these years are huge spans of time that God is working, but the whole time, everything, for thousands of years, because we think in terms of our lifetime sometimes, but God is working on a scale that we can't even fathom. And I, I share this sometimes when I talk about missions, like everybody, especially when we're younger, we want to have an impact on the world and make a huge change. Um, be faithful in what God calls you to do because God is doing something with you, but you don't have to be that one person that changes the whole world. He's doing that. Um, so yeah, so we're now getting, trying to bring us up there, have all this connection, and now we're getting to the encounter in the New Testament. Jesus, just to give you some context, John is one of the Gospels. So John... Um, if anyone remembers, yeah, he made it very clear uh, that why he wrote his gospel, and that was, um, obviously he's led by the Holy Spirit, um, but he says, but these are written, this is in John 20, 31, it says that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So let's remember that as I, I'm just going to read John 4 here, understanding some of the context of all of this has been building and accumulation of the coming of Christ, and, and you see John the Baptist paves the way, Jesus starts in ministries, he calls us some of his disciples, and um, he has some encounters with the, the Pharisees, and then he's leaving Judea and going north up to Galilee, and that's why he's cutting through Samaria. There were three routes at the time. Some of the pious Jews would actually go all the way to the coast. It's a mountainous region, but the shortest way was to go to Samaria, and he had a task to do, an appointment, divine appointment with this woman. Uh, so now that we have all that context, uh, I'm going to read here real quick or try to, uh, from John 4. I'll skip over a, a few parts, but, so, this is in John 4. If you have your Bible, please follow along today. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was, gain, was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now when he had, now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town, into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So I'm going to pause there for a second. We're going to try to preach through or talk through it today. Um, you saw the connection there? They're by Jacob's well. That's not arbitrary. And... You identify that um, he's a Samaritan. Yes. Ethnicity and religion and identity. So. Yes. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll get on that here. That's a good question. No, that's really good. So, this is one of the reasons why, if you remember last week, I did watch Kevin uh, spoke for the communion service, as I understand, um, on Luke 10, if I'm not mistaken. If, I could be wrong in the reference. Um, but he spoke on the... Uh, the what? The Good Samaritan. Yeah, and he talked a little bit, I think, about some of the differences, perhaps, of the Jews and the Samaritan. Um, so, I'll give you, I'll throw out a date there. Um, you remember that in Micah, they were rebellious, and it was foretold that they would go into exile. They would, basically, they'd be taken, they'd be killed off, and it happened. In about 722 before Christ, um, Assyria, and you can correct me if, you, if I'm wrong on this, but came and took the northern kingdom into exile, and then eventually Babylon, Babylon with all, and um, and so that happened. And what? Well, what happened? Those people that were there, that were part of the people of Israel, they were taken. And some of them remained, and then the peoples that were resettled there mixed with them. So the Jewish people saw them, they were Jews, essentially, but they were unclean. They were no longer pure because they had mixed with the other nations. And fast forward, when they come back, um, they were 
not, they didn't get along too well. And especially in the pious Jews, that they would actually avoid them. Um, and we're going to see here in her response how far that goes. So, Jesus goes north, the shortest distance to Galilee where he was going is probably through there. And I looked it up just out of curiosity. It's about, I, I've, I read some that said 25, the other one said 34 mile walk from Jerusalem from the area that he had been in. So it's a long walk. And if you're familiar with the Holy Land in the middle, it's mountainous. It's not an easy walk. Um, it is hot. Um, water is so important. That's why you see it in the Old Testament even. They even fought over wells and things like that. Um, so I imagine he's tired, and you actually you see that. Um, he's tired, and he sits down. Um, so we're seeing God's humanity. And God, Jesus was fully God, and he's fully man. This is something that's still a mystery to me sometimes. But he can identify with us. And here you see that. He gets, he's walked a long ways. He's tired as he was from the journey and he sat down by the well verse 6 and it was about the sixth hour sixth hour they started counting from when the sun would come up so that's noon essentially some bibles will, will translate it that way and the samaritan woman came out will you give me a drink we may not see any problem with him speaking to a woman in our culture but we have to understand in that culture um, the animosity between the samaritans and the jewish people jesus used it in a few things like the parable of uh, the Good Samaritan, to draw a harsh thing, a <laughs> divide. But here he's speaking to a woman. Rabbis at that time stayed so far apart from women that they oftentimes, as I was studying, did not even talk in public to women of their own family. So for him to not only be talking to a woman, but alone, with a Samaritan woman, was a no-go. So here he's already broken the scheme. Um, and then another thing, too, is that uh, you mentioned there, there's, a, there's a little note that he had sent his disciples to get some food. Um, the Jewish people at the time, they would not share or eat anything. Uh, they would not share anything. So they wouldn't... It would be strange for them, even culturally, to go in and get food into this. So he's breaking all these schemes that if we don't understand the context, we don't see that. So the Samaritan woman said to him, You are Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. There you see it. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. That's my analogy. I'm going to back up first. So I forgot something. That happens sometimes. Does anybody remember what happens before this encounter? There was somebody who came to visit Jesus in John chapter 3. Nicodemus. Very good. So you're going to see a contrast here. John in the gospel, he oftentimes, sure, like you'll see where Jesus is presenting something and using a physical analogy, but he's always talking about the spiritual, the kingdom of heaven, and his purpose, why he came. And they miss it. Nicodemus, who was a Jew, very well educated, who sought Jesus, actually. So you can see the comparison. You have the Samaritan woman who didn't seek out Jesus. She was just going about her daily stuff. And he saw her and interacted with her. She was on the lowest part of society. Women couldn't even testify to stuff back then. They didn't count. And we're going to see even characteristics about her in a moment that would show that it's even worse. And so there's, there's a difference completely opposite, but here he's talking and interacting with her, and in both times, if you remember, what did he say to Nicodemus? Unless you're born again, it was the physical, he missed it completely, and here he's saying, water, if you would ask me for water, a drink, uh, he would have given you living water. Um, now I will preface here, living water, uh, in ancient times, was water that was moving that was alive because, you know, if it sits still, it gets to be bad water. Um, so it was a well. Uh, Jacob's well was deep, and it had good flowing water through it. So, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself? as did also his sons and his flocks and herds. 
I can imagine she's a little bit indignant, perhaps. And Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst indeed. The water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. This sounds pretty good. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. And watch the deflect here. Oh, sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. But Jesus continues there. I'll pause there for a second. Here you see Jesus, he's interacting in the situation. He's having mercy on her because he shouldn't be interacting with her. And perhaps he's a bit indignant. And then he confronts her on sin. She tries to deflect and go towards something. Remember the differences of the Samaritans? You asked about the religious things. The Samaritans had built a temple and worshipped God near Shechem, near Shechem, where Abraham, they believe, had built his altar to the Lord. So in their religious system, which was mixed in with other things, they worshipped there. But the Jewish people worshipped only in Jerusalem, in the temple. So she deflects from, oh, this is about me, to, here, you're a prophet, you know these things. Um, and he responds to her. Verse 21. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Do you remember a time in the Old Testament where somebody said, I am? That's essentially what he's saying. I am he. This is the first place where publicly, openly, Christ is saying, I am. He's saying he's the Messiah, and it's clear. And who does he does it to? do it to? This, for me, is the most humbling thing. He doesn't do it openly to the Jews that he's going to the north because it wasn't yet his time, and they were, the Pharisees were going after him. He does it to a Samaritan, and a woman at that, whose testimony didn't count in that culture. That's, I think that's really cool. He broke all these schemes. Sometimes I think in our faith that when we share the gospel, because it is the good news of Jesus Christ, uh, we get scared. I, I'm a missionary by profession, <laughs> which is weird by calling, I should say it that way. Um, but I still get nervous, and people sometimes tell me, oh, it's so easy when you share the gospel. It's, it's never easy. The thing is that I have this great gift that God has given me, and I love Jesus Christ so much, that I, and I love people so much because he's given me a heart for people, and I want to share what he has given me. Because if you have the greatest gift of love, then we need to share that. That overflowing water, that living water, to be sharing it. That's why I think this is a great message for a missionary to share, too. <laughs> or for the church. back to my notes here. <laughs> you see Jesus that he's giving her the thing. He says, if you would ask, he's not saying like many religions do, do this, do that, and then I'll give you this. He's saying, if you would ask, I'd give you 
living water. And she missed it too. She was focused on the physical stuff that I mentioned earlier. But Christ was teaching a spiritual lesson of salvation. And I think she got it. Because just as his disciples are returning in 27, surprised to find him talking to a woman, but it's interesting, no one asked him, who do you, what do you want, or why are you talking with her? So then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And they came out of the town and made their way towards him. That's cool. She left it. She went. And it's interesting that she acknowledged. He said everything. He told me everything about me. He was talking about her sin. She was probably known. That was probably why some scholars believe that she went, or most scholars believe that she went out to this well in the middle of the day because it was a time when women didn't go. It was women's job to get the water. They typically do it at the beginning of the day or the end of the day because it's the coolest. Um, I don't know at this point in time in the world, but I can tell you southern Spain was his about the same level. Uh, Israel is really hot. It's about 120 degrees in summer. So to go at that time of day was not common. She leaves it. The disciples, I think, are trying to figure out what's going on. It says, meanwhile, the disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the reaper draws his wages. Even now the harvest the crop. He harvests the crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the many benefits of their labor. Once again, we see another thing, a physical thing he's talking about, and they're missing the spiritual thing at the same time these are his disciples. You saw that she went, and then the people from Samaria are coming out, to hear because of what she had said, her testimony. She has a personal encounter with Jesus Christ that changes her life, and she goes, and even in her doubt, he says, could this be the Messiah? And she tells it with other pe to other people, even acknowledging her sin, because he said everything about me, and they came. We have a responsibility as a church because we've been sent. I've seen, especially on the back of, let me see if I have it here, of the bulletin even. Have you guys noticed what the verse is on the vision on the top? We've been called to make disciples, to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Same thing that John was doing in the gospel. And Christ, what is he doing? He's evangelizing. He's telling the good news of his kingdom and what he's come to do. And there's something in here, too, that, I, that stuck out to me. It says, one sows and another reaps. And he mentions um, with, that I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. All of the Bible pointed to Christ. The prophets, they're all pointing to the Messiah. Um, the Messiah has come. He's revealed himself. And now it demands a response. So many of the Samaritans, verse 39 from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did, so when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. I have some questions for you and some statements here. Do we understand better when I say Jesus is the living water? What that means? 
That means that, because remember he talked about the spiritual things. Uh, Christ came to save us from our sins, to restore our relationship with the Father. He did what we could not do. He drew near to us. And Jesus alone is the living water that can satisfy our thirst. Everybody has a hole. I don't know. I, Kevin and I watch his messages when we're here. He always says, everybody's got their crap. And he does his arms like this too. <laughs> I've got my crap too. Um, we all do. We're all sinners. We've fallen away. We have a need for a Savior. This Savior is Jesus Christ. If you don't know him, you need to know him. He's not shocked by our sin. He knows us. If you look at it with a Samaritan woman, he doesn't sit there and say, aha, look what you did, I knew this. But he knew what her sin was. She acknowledged it. When we receive Christ, we have to acknowledge our sin. And we have to believe in him for that living water. And once we have that living water, our lives should overflow with it. Because he blesses us with his spirit. I mentioned before, we have the greatest gift that can ever be given. That is salvation and restoration to the Father through Jesus Christ. And if we love others, if we love our family members, if we love our neighbors, if we love God, we'll be obedient to him to share that message. We need to share with others. So I'm going to ask you guys a question. You saw it here, how Jesus broke some molds. Uh, we don't understand fully the depth of it, what it meant for him speaking with the Samaritans, but maybe there are those people in your life that you would never talk to normally. I don't know, whether it's because of a religious difference or because, oh, they're a sinner. <laughs> I just need to look in the mirror. I'm a sinner too. Maybe there's somebody that smells bad. <laughs> That's homeless. We have, you guys have those gift bags or the, what are they called? Blessing bags. There's the little card in there. Maybe God wants you to use that to engage in a conversation over something as simple as water. Everybody drinks. Hopefully, water. <laughs> You can use normal, everyday things. You don't have to be a super theologian. But if Christ has filled your heart, share that living water with others. So have you invited anyone lately to come and see who Christ is? You saw she left her jar and she went. And she said, come, see this man who maybe is this Messiah. Be attentive to divine appointments. This is something that on the field over the years I've learned to, to practice, but I'm no, by no means very good at it. Uh, but that is to be praying always, as much as possible, as, uh, for divine appointments. And I will say from experience, typically when I don't want to share is when somebody trips and falls on me, it's like, share with you about Jesus. Um, <laughs> that's not super regular, though. So be attentive to divine appointments, opportunities to share the gospel. Yes? What do you mean by divine appointments? Divine appointments. Okay. That's a good question. Um, that's a bit of Christianese in my speaking. So um, by divine appointment, I mean God places people within our lives that we, through relationships, whether it's through work or through sports, hobbies, things that we have in common that don't know him or that perhaps do but need encouragement in him. Those opportunities that he has when he places on our heart perhaps a thought that's not from us that's like share with this person or pray for this person or offer to pray for this person. I consider those to be divine appointments. People that he has placed in our circle of influence and opportunities to share of what he has done for us because we're sent, the harvest we talked about, to share Christ that others might believe. Does that answer your question, I hope? Okay. <laughs> I put down here too, have tough conversations about sin and present Jesus the Savior. I don't know about you guys, but it's always easy to say like, oh, that's okay what you're doing. Um, don't approve sin. 
don't avoid it either. It's a reality. But recognize first your own. I think we have to be humble as Christians to remember that we're no better than the sinners that don't know Christ. We're in the same boat. The only difference is that we've been redeemed and we have salvation in Jesus Christ, a hope that they do not have. Have mercy and compassion on them like Christ did with this woman. And then finally, share the good news of the living water that is Jesus Christ, Savior of the world. And God, as you read in John 3.16, how many people know that verse? Somebody can recite it to me now. Yes. God sent his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It doesn't mean that you're not going to die physically. I've, I've heard the joke in the U.S. at least that there are two things that are sure, death and taxes. Um, we're either going to die physically or the Lord is going to come back and take others up with him. But this is talking about um, life, eternal life, the spiritual things, again, in Christ. God loves us. Loves the sinners. We shouldn't forget what he has done for us and share and forget to share that as well. It might not always be, always be comfortable. I'm sure that the Samaritan woman wasn't having a comfortable conversation with Jesus because remember, she shouldn't have even been talking to him. He shouldn't have been talking to her. But he did. If we're to be like Jesus, there are probably people, those divine appointments, that will have to have a conversation that will be tough. And we'll have to talk about sin, perhaps. But we can do it with mercy. And recognizing that we, too, are sinners. But we have hope. So I want to end with uh, those of you that have your bulletin. Perhaps have you guys read with me the vision. I'm kind of sad it doesn't include the next one because it's one of my wife's favorite verses. So I'm going to look it up here. We'll read it together. It says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And then I'm going to share the last part of it, which is my wife's favorite. It says, And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is something that God has told us to do, Christ himself. He's equipped us to do it by His Spirit. And even if we lack confidence in it, we need to share. We have the hope of the world, and how can we love others if we don't share that love with them? So here, let us, I'm going to pray for us here. Father God, I thank you for your word. Thank you for the story that many of us know of the Samaritan woman and uh, what you did in interacting with her, breaking schemes, Lord, and sharing with her living water, words of life, uh, that you are the Messiah, our Savior. Thank you for your love, Lord. I pray that you would help us to grow in love of you and passion for your word, and that you would help us, Lord, to do exactly what you have told us to do, and that is to make disciples and to teach them everything that you've commanded us. We cannot do this without your help, Lord, so please help us to be on task, to be attentive to your divine appointments, and to be growing and to be in your hands and feet here on earth. We need your help, Lord. Thank you. We praise you and pray that you would help us to live this out as we leave here today. In Jesus' name, amen.